Pauline and Burtwell, this is Reasonable Faith, Compelling Reason, a talk show where we interview some of the leading Christian thinkers, evangelists, teachers and apologists in the world today. Today I'm joined by Martin Isles of the Australian Christian Lobby. Good evening, Martin. Good evening, Paul, although I believe it's morning where you are, it's so uh, very... you've you matched my time zone. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Well, I was on here an hour before. I got the timings wrong, so <laughs> I've been, oh, okay. I've been waiting a while. Well, yeah. Last time we didn't have daylight savings, so... That's what it is. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so strange things are happening in Australia. We're hearing about it over here in the UK. Quite shocking things uh, to do with the Christian church and uh, something called the Change or Suppression Practices Prohibition Bill 2020. Could you tell us a little bit about that, please, Martin? Let's know what's going on. Well, it's sure a mouthful. It's a bit of a word salad. <laughs> but look, this is a bill that's been introduced in the Australian state of Victoria. Um, that's the second most populous state in the country. So it's where the city of Melbourne is, population of over 5 million in the city of Melbourne. Um, and, you know, the whole state, I forget what the total population is, but it's, it's, it's big. It's second to New South Wales where Sydney is. And um, the government there is, it's extremely, um, they, they build themselves as the most progressive government uh, in Australia. And uh, they've really shown themselves to be that uh, over a number of years now. But it's a very progressive jurisdiction. People sort of find them they're wildly popular uh, for whatever reason. But it's a very progressive kind of jurisdiction. But one of the latest things that they've introduced is this change and suppression conversion practices prohibition bill, which you've just mentioned. And on the outside, the, the rhetoric that the government has put forward has been that this is a bill to end, uh, to quote Premier Daniel Andrews of the state of Victoria, um, bigoted quackery mm -hmm. uh, and to stop practices from the dark ages and all this kind of stuff. But that does not stack up with what the bill actually says. Um, the bill, I mean, the words of the bill, literally, it says it's a bill to prohibit, and this is the language of the relevant section, conduct, whether or not it's consensual, conduct for the purposes of changing or suppressing or inducing a change or suppression of a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, the punishment for being found guilty of that conduct, um, and conduct is an incredibly broad word. Mm -hmm. Conduct includes breathing, for heaven's sake. Conduct includes anything at all. Um, we can, you know, of the course of this interview, I'll hopefully run through some case studies as to what it would include. Yeah. Um, but the punishment is up to 10 years in jail if you cause injury. Now, injury is very loosely defined. So you go to the Crimes Act for that, and it's uh, basically if someone has temporary mental harm, uh, and they get a sympathetic medical professional to say, yep, mental harm, temporary, and part of it was caused by your conduct, whether it was a prayer, whether it was a reading from the Bible, whether you were a parent and you didn't want the kid to take hormones, whatever, anything at all, uh, that therefore is criminal, punishable by up to 10 years in jail and a fine of up to $200,000. Now, there's no carve-outs. There's no exceptions. It doesn't say, oh, unless you're a parent or unless the person is a minor, or unless you're a medical professional acting in the best interests of your patient, uh, or unless you're a religious practitioner, you know, preaching your doctrines and beliefs, mm. nothing like that. In fact, the bill specifically includes, specifically includes some really worrying examples like prayer. Uh, it says an example could include prayer practices, whatever that is, but prayer, uh, religious practices. Uh, it could include a referral. Uh, so if someone comes to you and says, I've got unwanted same-sex attraction or I've got a gender dysphoria issue, and you say, hey, you know, Bob is a Christian who walked the same road as you. Why don't you talk to Bob? He might know a thing or two. Mm -hmm. That's a referral. You can't do that. That's also criminal. Uh, and also probably one of the biggest clangers or two of the biggest clangers would be, first of all, I think it's Section 64. It adds a specific um, um, example to the Family Violence Orders Act um, or similar word to say, Basically, that a parent who doesn't affirm, fully affirm, and go along with a child's gender identity or sexual orientation. So the child might say, I'm gender dysphoric, I've got gender, I'm gender questioning. The parents say, don't take hormones, you're 14, you know, it's irreversible. Uh, it specifically includes a parent-child scenario where that parent becomes a domestic abuser and a criminal under the Act as well. Uh, and the other thing is that the Act has application outside of Victoria. So if you do something in another state, but someone in Victoria gets wind of it or is affected by it, they can pursue you. 
So this affects people in Sydney, people in Brisbane, people in Western Australia, people in the top end in Darwin, anywhere at all. Uh, and so this bill is so wide, it captures, in fact, the explanatory memorandum specifically says it's meant to include conversations with community leaders. Um, so, you know, from what I'm saying, you can see straight away, there's more to this than the government has claimed. Uh, and in fact, it probably is the most serious attack on free speech, parents' rights and religious freedom that I've ever seen in this country. It sounds absolutely insane. Um, you, you mentioned this includes the medical profession, so doctors, psychiatrists? Yes, absolutely. So, so if somebody um, approaches a doctor and, and asks for help, the doctor has to say no? That is probably what will happen, in my view, um, yeah. because in the medical profession, you get an awful lot of um, defensive practice. That is, if something's legally risky or perceived to be legally risky, then medical professionals won't do it and won't touch it. They'll have all sorts of protocols to avoid it. And basically what this bill does is, let's say a child does come to a doctor uh, and the child says, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a boy trapped in a girl's body. Um, and I want transition. Uh, I'm quite, I'm really obsessed about this. I'm really tormented by this. This is really hurting me and I want it now. And the doctor sits there and goes, hmm, your parents are telling me you've had a diff difficult few years. Uh, I can see here that you've got a history of, who knows, it could be child sexual abuse. That's often a problem in these cases. And it used to be looked for by the medical profession. Or you could have a history of aut autism. Uh, as many as 50% of young people presenting at gender clinics in Australia with gender dysphoria have autism or a history of autism uh, and various things like this. Or you could be depressed. Uh, you could have had a very difficult social life. There could be something going along psychologically. And I would like to find out. So I think, you know, at the tender age of whatever the child is, says a 15 year old, you know, I think you should wait. Uh, and I think we should try and treat some of this other stuff before we make you do irreversible things to your body. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, You've got a doctor who is inducing someone to suppress their gender identity. And that's what the bill makes criminal. You will not get doctors prepared to do that anymore, right. even when it's in the absolute best interests of the patient. All that child has to do is grow up and then go, yeah, you know what? That doctor hurt me. Mm. Uh, and you're in big trouble. Mm. Yeah, because there's a lot of cases at the moment, even here in the UK, of people who... like and then they kind of go on to regret the change that's occurred. Is any of this being taken into consideration with this bill? It just doesn't seem that anything at all has been taken into consideration. Um, they apparently did a consultation. Uh, certainly our organisation was part of the consultation. There wasn't a lot of truth told in that consultation, right. I can tell you. Uh, and it's all just, it's just come out like this. And I, I can see what they're trying to do. Um, there is a Midsummer Pride Festival uh, over Christmas. Um, the government is probably the most LGBT affirming government we've ever seen in this country. Uh, and what they're going to do is they're going to go to the festival and say, we are world leaders. There's no law anywhere in the world. And look how far we've taken it. We will stamp this out. And that's what it is. It's, 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 it's pandering to a constituency, but it's doing so in a way that is demented in how far it goes, frankly. Mm. Um, and to actually have an Australian government saying prayers could be criminal, conversations could be criminal. Not my words, their words. Yep. Uh, uh, um, being a responsible parent saying, you know, 14-year-old, don't go on hormone replacement therapy, which is irreversible and a tremendous pain. Absolutely, yep. It's, it's unreal. Like, people think it's just hormones. No, 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 no. You know, it's it's serious. It's really serious. Um, and it doesn't it doesn't reverse. So the parents are in trouble. The doctors are in trouble. This this goes um, so unbelievably far, and they're almost making it into a badge of honour. Mm. How far it actually goes. Uh, there is some misleading stuff going on. So, for example, the opposition party was briefed by the government on this, uh, and the briefing that they were given was was just false. It was false legal analysis. Uh, what they were claiming about the bill, like for example, a sermon by a pastor, uh, would not be a crime because it wouldn't be directed towards an individual. Okay. Nowhere in the bill does it say that the conduct has to be directed towards an individual. It doesn't say that. It says directed towards a person, mm -hmm. but a person is anyone sitting in the audience. Sure. It doesn't say that it can't be multiple persons. It doesn't say that it can't, you know, it's, it's crazy. Uh, that, and so, um, so that includes social media as well? Well, yes, it does. Like actually. sermons so online, rather, yeah. Well, exactly. So if you're a pastor in, well, let's say, so let's say you're a pastor and you are um, in Sydney. 
uh, and you're in the great sunlit uplands of freedom in Sydney, you don't have to worry about this wretched bill down in Victoria, you know, or do you? Because let's say you give a sermon on Christian marriage. Uh, and let's say you say, you know, it's God's plan, it's God's will that each of us, uh, you know, gets married and is committed to one man uh, and one woman to the exclusion of all others for life. Uh, that's God's plan for you. For you. That's God's will. Uh, and let's say he goes through a bit of Ephesians 4, he goes through Ephesians 5, and goes through a little bit of Romans 1 uh, and tidies up. And it's just a perfectly straightforward Christian sermon. And then let's say that somebody comes up to him afterwards and says, hey, pastor, you know, sometimes I'm attracted to people of the same sex. Um, or, or whatever, and says, you know, would you pray for me? Uh, and the pastor says, sure, I'll pray for you, no worries, you know. Mate puts hands on his shoulder, says a prayer, and says, look, mate, I'm here for, for you. Anytime you want to talk, just come talk to me, no problem. Mm. All right, so here's the problem. The pastor has just done something which this bill would say is criminal. Uh, firstly, in the sermon, because it is conduct, it's directed towards people, uh, and it's for the purposes of suppressing the sexual orientation or gender identity. He is saying, if you follow God's will for your life, this will be what your sexual orientation looks like. Now, that's su suppressing, right? That's inducing someone to suppress, to follow someone who comes up afterwards to talk to him. Uh, and that is exactly the same problem. But if that pastor was in Sydney and that sermon was online, same problem. If that pastor was in Sydney and that conversation was had over email, same problem. Uh, and this is the, 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 the pernicious nature of, of the legislation um, in, in, in its extraterritorial application. A lot of people say to me, oh, that can't be right. You know, that'll be struck down. And they just walk away. And I, no, actually, because legally it is perfectly acceptable for a state police force or a state law court to pursue harm that might have been committed in other states but suffered within the state at hand. Mm. And so if a person is in Victoria and they say, oh, I've been harmed, by what Joe did in Sydney, it's perfectly legitimate law for the police to go and get Joe from Sydney. Wow. Yeah, just can't get my mind around it. It's just, it's absolute insanity. Like, like, like I said, you know, um, I think that the idea is that they want to go and say, we are world leaders. And yeah. they want to beat their chest just... over it and say, we've stamped out uh, bigotry, we've stamped out hatred, we've stamped out suppression. Meanwhile, you know, I mean, here in Australia, we, we've just had a case where, I mean, this is before this law's even in place. We just had a case uh, which has been reported in one of our major newspapers where um, a, a Christian couple, mm -hmm. um, their 15-year-old daughter um, started to um, have uh, gender-questioning feelings uh, and became depressed um, and reported that she was suicidal. All this played out online in mm. transgender affirming Facebook groups. And the parents were largely ignorant of what was going on until she went and presented at an emergency department and said, I'm suicidal and I'm gender dysphoric. And from that point forward, when, when the emergency doctors and nurses found out that her parents wouldn't use the correct pronouns to refer to her and things like that, uh, and that they wouldn't be affirming of her gender orientation, and presumably according to her own testimony, uh, they shut the parents out. Uh, and that girl has now been removed from her parents ever wow. since. Uh, and the state-funded state, state funded legal aid is now fighting for her uh, as a minor to receive hormone replacement therapy against the wishes of her parents, and they haven't seen or heard from her for some time. Now, that's not the first case of its kind in Australia. Usually uh, it doesn't play out in the law courts, but it does happen, and I've heard many stories. And this is before this bill passes, but see, that the nastiness of this bill is it adds teeth. It actually says, yeah, you know what, those parents, particularly if that girl in her troubled situation as a teenager, and there are many a troubled teenager, mm. and the parents actually say she needs, they, they want her to undergo non-invasive psychotherapy, uh, which is perfectly reasonable for somebody who's suffering um, uh, with a mental torment like this uh, and, and mental concern. It's completely normal. It's completely rational. And frankly, and they say they know why she's struggling because when they give a list of, you know, she had a difficult start to puberty, she's uh, got some social isolation issues and all this kind of stuff. And I'm going, well, they're her parents. Surely, surely they're best placed to know these things. Surely their view on this matters. Uh, and who does the state think they are to say, no, no, we know better. And the teeth in this Victorian bill is that potentially they're criminals. Mm. Ten years in jail. That's uh, potentially. mad. Absolute madness. It's, it's unthinkable. It should send a chill down the spine of every parent 
uh, to think that such a thing could be possible and such a thing is actually written into this law. Um, and also, probably under the Domestic Violence Family Protection Orders Act, I forget the exact name, uh, they've actually committed a, an act of domestic violence, hmm. uh, according to an amendment put in that act by this bill. So, um, you know, as I say this, um, I, I'm, I'm conscious that people sort of sit there and they, they sort of listen for a minute like, hmm, and then something in the brain goes, no, this isn't right. Hmm. It doesn't pass the sniff test. It doesn't pass the pub test. Something this guy is saying doesn't stack up. It's too extreme. I'm telling you, I've only used the words of the bill most of the time this yeah. evening. And, you know, it is what it is. And I'm as shocked and alarmed as the next person because, frankly, I could go to jail over this for the things I say online hmm. if a Victorian is sufficiently upset. And you said this girl's 15. Uh, in the particular case I described, she was 15 mm. when she was 15. taken from her parents, correct. I mean, I'm a parent. I've got children who are 15. I was a school teacher prior to being a full-time minister. Used to kind of teenage girls and boys, very hormonal at the age of 14, 15. They're not in a place to make a decision for the rest of their life as to what gender they're going to be. Because, you know, it's such a, an awkward age for them. Surely it should, you know, 20, 21 let the kind yeah. of hormones die down first. Let's make a, a real life decision. That's just, 15 is just insane. It's crazy. Well, here's the thing. I mean, in the state of Victoria, a 15 year old is not allowed to get a tattoo. Yeah. Even, even with their parents' permission, they're not allowed to get a tattoo. And you're sitting there saying they're going to take hormone replacement. Yeah, for the rest, it's going to change their whole life. It doesn't make any sense. They're never going to be the same again. No. And the astounding impacts it has on their, uh, on their, their, their body, uh, the things it does to their anatomy that are irreversible. The, uh, the, the, it's incredible. I mean, I've, I've had to read testimonials from people that describe this stuff. In fact, on my latest episode of The Truth of It, I, I, I read part of hmm. one young man's uh, horrendous struggle, um, you know, post-hormone um, therapy. And it's the most heartbreaking thing. You know, it's absolutely awful. Um, and I sit there and think, wow, and a parent, you know, a parent sits there and goes, I don't want this for my child. You know, I think my child will, will, will be able to handle life better without going down this line. Uh, and I think that's a pretty reasonable judgment to make. And it's perfectly within the right of a parent uh, who has a minor child. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's their wisdom as they say, you know, I actually remember this is an interesting story. I, I remember going to, in the early days of this conversion therapy stuff, you know, back before it was this crazy, um, I remember having a little interaction with a, a federal senator in yeah. our Senate, our upper house here in the, in the federal parliament. And um, she was really pushing for more and more, um, you know, recognition of this, you know, conversion therapy stuff and more laws. And she really was the full, the full bottle on it. Like she was, uh, she was really into getting kids out of parents' care and all the rest of it. And she actually said to me, you know, um, she, she challenged me on this. She said, do you think conversion therapy is effective? I said, well, 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 we're not talking about conversion therapy. Let's be clear. You know, what I'm talking about here is the parent situation that, that you and I, Paul, have just talked about. And I said, I said, you know, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, and she actually looked at me and she said, but what is the state supposed to do when a parent takes their, um, uh, takes their transgender child to church? And I sat there and thought, ah. I see, that's where you're at. And I actually said, look, here's the thing. I think that the most shocking, that one of the most terrible things a parent can do to their child is raise them an atheist. Hmm. I think that's awful. I think that's a, it's, a, it's an unspeakable tragedy. And I think it will have profound and lifelong effects on that child of, of serious, serious gravity, because it's, it's not true. The, the fact is that God is real and he is their God. Hmm. And, and that is unbelievable ramifications. I said, you know what? It has never even occurred to me, never occurred to me for a second that the children of atheist parents should be confiscated by the state. Why? Because there's greater values at play. Hmm. There's something so important here, which is the integrity and the principle of the integrity of the family. Uh, and that's the state has no business stepping in there. So there's no business except in extreme circumstances and where there is real abuse and things like that. Um, you know, the state has no business. And uh, likewise, we mentioned prayer before. And one of the great things that our, the Catholic Archbishop of Victoria said was, um, you know, what I pray, who I pray with uh, and how I pray is none of the government's business. Uh, and here we are. These are the principles of Lacey. We're saying, OK, we're going to actually erode these principles and let the government step in on this this issue which is going to have profound consequences. But what does it mean next time they want to legislate in a way that interferes with family, yeah. interferes with prayer, 
interferes with these sacred principles that I've been talking about. Yeah, I find it absolute wickedness. It's uh, very, very shocking. So just to go over, you mentioned conversion therapy. I've never heard of conversion therapy before in church. <laughs> now, I, I've been a minister for 20 plus years. So um, so what we're we talking about here, they're, they're, they're talking about prayer. If somebody requests prayer because they want to change, that's considered illegal under this under this bill. That's called conversion therapy. Preaching on biblical sexuality is is considered conversion therapy and and possibly preaching online too well they've done a bit of a switcheroo here they've called it the change and suppression practices okay bill. and so that's change or suppression right it's what those things are and this was always going to happen you know i'm with you paul i mean i've i've been around conservative christian churches all my life uh, and it wasn't until I started working in politics and dealing with activists that I heard this phrase, conversion therapy. And I sort of went, eh? It doesn't even make sense. Yeah, what is I mean, that? <laughs> therapy therapy. entirely different. Yeah. And I know nobody in the Christian church has ever invented something called conversion therapy. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> Not it's heard ludicrous. Of it. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I've asked around, you know, I actually made it a point for some time to ask audiences and people and say, has anyone ever heard of this happening in churches in Australia, you know, in your lifetime? And the only time I ever had someone say, oh, yeah, I've heard about it. Actually, where they heard about it was in relation to a government um, institution. Uh, It was some kind of mental health uh, um, facility uh, in Western Australia. And I was like, well, that's a government institution. It's not it's not, you know, Christian churches. And this is the great lie here is that they've actually invented this term conversion therapy, which is not our term. Mm. And I understand that initially it did refer to some practices uh, like um, I think these mainly happened in America uh, where there were some boot camp style things. Um, There was some electric shock therapy stuff. There was revulsion therapy. So really awful things, you know, some stuff coercive and abusive. uh, And and used about that kind of stuff. And I sit there and go, well, ban it, you know, just ban it. I mean, yeah. no one, like, who cares? Like, it, it, it's not a problem for us for you to ban that because none of us want to do any such thing. And indeed, it, none of those things um, have happened in churches in Australia in, well, certainly in most people's lifetime. Um, and uh, that's the problem. What's happened is that at some stage along the way, they've started, they've continued to talk about conversion therapy. And that makes people upset. It makes people angry. Uh, it makes people really, really, um, you know, motivated that, that someone like me would come out and say, well, hold on, stop for a second. And they're going, what do you mean you support conversion therapy, you wicked bigot? And I'm like, well, no. I mean, even if I did support conversion therapy, I'm hardly going to come out in public and say so, right? <laughs> so, no, uh, it's not what's going on here. This term has been expanded like some kind of Trojan horse to smuggle in a whole bunch of other stuff. And it's not until you read the legislation and read the detail that you realize just how far they're going. Hmm. Uh, so I read the detail of this legislation. I remember sitting down and scratch my head for a while thinking, am I missing something? Because, uh, you know, I'm a lawyer by background. And uh, you know, I read it. I saw what it said. I scratched my head. I looked up the definitions. I scratched my head. And then I thought, wow, they've done it. I mean, they're for real. And, of course, to come out and say we are opposed to this ban on conversion therapy it is a tremendously fearful thing for a lot of people to do. Uh, and that's probably why we're seeing so little pushback on this. Mm. And also why we're seeing, can you believe it or not, at the stage of this recording, uh, the Liberal Party opposition, which is our, um, our, it's our, supposed to be our Conservative Party, um, they're not even opposing it. Right. Uh, and I think right. it's a fear question. Um, so anyway, such are the times in which we live. Okay, what about the churches in Australia? What are they, what are they saying about this? Not enough, if I can be perfectly honest. Um, and, you know, I can understand a delay for people who are trying to understand how to speak about it or, or what it all means or verify their facts. Um, but it's getting to the point now where it's like, well, come on, folks, where are you? Um, this bill is so wicked in its oppression of Christian faith yeah. uh, and Christian teaching um, and Christian families. I mean, it's a targeted strike on the Christian family or the family in general, frankly, because most average Australians are not in favour of this stuff. Um, it's a targeted strike on the Christian church and the gospel uh, and what the gospel says about important contemporary issues. In fact, it criminalises rebuttal, basically, of the LGBT narrative. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 um, it is a targeted strike on, on, on good medical professionals who are Christians, who are everywhere, 
and many of them went into medicine because of their Christian faith. Um, and it's all of those things. And I sit there and I go, you know, uh, now's the time. If the church was ever going to take the gag off and say and actually speak into a political issue, now's mm. the time to say this is this is wrong. So we've had um, the Catholic Archbishop of Victoria, uh, Peter Comensoli. Uh, he came out really strongly, and he uh, got an article in the newspaper down there, which was really fantastic. Um, and so, thank you to the Catholic Archbishop of Victoria. Um, also, the Presbyterian Church of Victoria. Uh, they have been really, really solid. Um, they don't the, the media don't pay them as much attention, but they're really, really solid in their in their response, and they've been very organised and ready. Um, other than that. Um, you know, there's another organization called Freedom for Faith, and I'm grateful for their involvement. Um, and there's, um, there's a couple of pastors, you know, a guy called Murray Campbell, and I think one or two others who are just acting as independent pastors. But I look at the churches in Victoria in general, and I think, hello, you know, what's going on? Mm. And I, I just wonder whether, and, and, you know, I've mentioned those who have spoken, and that really is all who have spoken. Uh, you know, there's a lot of conservative organisations in Australia and organisations that claim to stand for freedoms and Western values. They haven't said boo. They haven't right. spoken up. And some of them are headquartered in, in Victoria. IPA, I'm looking at you. Mm. <laughs> Victorian headquarters. Not even the guts to say anything. Mm. Uh, and it's fear. I mm. think it's just plain fear. It's fear, of, it's fear of man. It's fear of losing popularity. And it's fear of being misunderstood. I just feel like saying to people in this generation, you know, you can't do a better job of managing the reputation of the gospel than God himself. Yeah. You know, if God has declared things and said things clearly and you refuse to do the same, you, you're claiming to do a better job than God of looking after his own reputation. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, and also you can't do a better job of looking after your future and looking after how, you know, the, the blowback of something like this will go than God is. Uh, this is the great example of Daniel in a place like Babylon. He trusted God to sort all that out. He didn't lack conviction. He didn't lack courage. He didn't lack a, a will to do the right thing. And he followed through on all of that, trusting actually that he wasn't going to be any better at making his future work than God would be at making his future work. <laughs> you know? And so you know, here we are in a situation where I'm sort of saying, honor God, not men, for heaven's sake, guys, you know, literally for heaven's sake. Hmm. Um, and uh, and, and, and there's, a, there's a sort of a frustration setting in on my part right now where I'm saying, hello, anyone? <laughs> uh, and I'm very grateful for the few that have spoken, but this should be an army. Uh, it should be a chorus, uh, and it should be a chorus that won't be quiet because you can't criminalise aspects of the gospel. You can't criminalise Christian discipleship. You can't criminalise dissent. Uh, you can't criminalise prayers. Wow, you know, the state has no business doing that. And you've got some of the largest churches in the world in Australia that I know of, um, some big names, and they should be speaking out about this. Um, I, I agree, yeah. Um, maybe what can the average person do about this what what um what do i mean by that i mean what steps do they need to take um to kind of combat this maybe they don't know the practicality of what to do what would yeah. what, what would you recommend totally get it and look one of the challenges we've got of course is that if you are um you know if you are a christian in australia uh, you're not used to a history of activism mm. uh, the activists are sort of the bad guys <laughs> you know like, you, you hate to be called an activist and you don't think like an activist so you think as somebody who can rely on the political process to largely take care of you yeah uh, I'm, I'm here to say that's changed you know so my point there is that you know if you want something to change you need to be a part of it uh, we're at the point now where we're the minority. We're at the point now where uh, we can't trust the political process. And if we're concerned, we need to do something. We, we actually need to do something. Uh, and the easiest thing to do is to send an email or make a phone call. Um, you have a local MP uh, and you have local upper house and lower house MP in your state. Ring their office. And people are afraid to do that. But I want to say this. You're their constituent. Hmm. They're not going to be rude to you. They're going to listen to you. They're not going to, you know, abuse you because you vote for them. And not only that, you don't need to be a wordsmith or anything like that. All you need to do is just, you know, calmly and respectfully say, uh, this is really terrible. Maybe give some reasons if you can. If you can't, that's fine. And just say, look, I urge you to vote against it because I'm... And tell a bit of your story. I'm a Christian. I'm really worried. I've got kids. They're 15. You know, I care for them. Uh, do something like that. And they will log that call. Uh, and it will be kept in a, in a quota 
system and the more calls they get, the more pressure will be put on them. Fortunately, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands actually, I think, of Victorians have made these calls. So you're unlikely to be the first, that's the other benefit, uh, they're ready for you, um, and, uh, and, and get ahead and do it. Look, and if you're too scared, send an email, uh, ideally both. ACL has a campaign at the moment, acl.org.au. Click on one of the tiles on the homepage. You can go through and fill out your email and send it off to your local representatives without even having to look them up. Um, so uh, I would encourage both of those things. The other thing I'd encourage for Christians generally, whether they're Christians in leadership, whether they're Christians who are just ACL supporters, whether they're whatever. Again, I just point back to the things I said before about, you know, don't fear. Um, you know, there's a reason that the most common command in the Bible is fear not. Um, because when we do what is right, and we do what is right for the right reasons, um, God says, I'm with you. And that's actually the reason we fear not. Nearly every time in the Bible it says fear not, it usually says, for I am with you. Um, and, you know, I will go before you is another thing that it says. And I just say again, you know, don't try and control your reputation or how things will play out, you know, better than God can. Um, he, he can take care of that uh, if we do the right thing for the right reasons. Yeah. So yeah. just just in closing now, a couple of a couple of questions are, you know, I don't know Australian law very well, but are there any protection? Religious freedoms? Yeah, not really. Not really. <laughs> OK, so yeah, it Australia sounds like that. Really, yeah. Yeah. Australia is really unique, actually, in the Western world and, and actually for good reasons initially. And, and now we're starting to see some of the bad side of it. But um, uh, Australia is very unique in that we don't have a Bill of Rights or a Charter of Rights in this right. country. Um, and uh, I think we are basically the only really Western country in the world left that doesn't. If New Zealand's got one, UK's got one, America's obviously got one, Canada's got one, Europe's got the European Charter. We, we don't have anything like that. Now, having said that, there is a, basically one right uh, really given significant treatment in our Constitution, which is the right to freedom of religion. And, you, and most people go, well, there you go, right? It's, that's, it's solved. No, unfortunately not. Um, back in um, the early days of Australia's federation, the High Court heard some cases on that section and they interpreted it in such a ludicrously narrow way that it means literally nothing. So, uh, you know, just in a nutshell, that's not going to do us any good. <laughs> so right. Australia really relies on the parliaments to protect human rights. And that's why the parliament's failing in this instance. OK, so finally, then, how can people support the ACL in this? And um, can people outside of Australia support you as well in this? I mean, what's the process for that? Oh, look, I'd say that if people aren't in the jurisdiction of Victoria, um, you know, and I mentioned some points of action there, uh, you know, the, the best thing I suppose to do is firstly pray. Um, you know, we're instructed to pray. And this conversion therapy thing is a global movement. Uh, Amnesty International around Zealand, in Canada, in the United Kingdom, in the US, and Kamala Harris, the new deputy, the new vice president. Um, she's a very big proponent of these. Um, now, none of them are as bad as Victoria's, but some of them are pretty bad. Uh, and if Victoria goes this far, it's going to get a lot worse. Uh, so this is a global movement. So I'd say be alert, be awake, for one thing, yep. and pray about it. Um, I have seen some of the biggest wins in our politics, and we've got a big constituency, and we can run, you know, rip snorters of campaigns and all the rest of it. But prayer has really moved things more than anything else, in my experience. Mm. And the other thing is, feel free to feel free to donate. You know, <laughs> we can receive donations from anyone. ACL.org.au slash donate, um, and, uh, and and feel free to do that. And we do receive some international donations from time to time. I'm, you know, very blessed by that, uh, and I'm blown away by it. Uh, so thank you. Okay, just want to close in some prayer for you now, Martin, if that's okay. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ for Martin and for the ACL that you give them tremendous wisdom from heaven, that you give them grace upon grace. Lord God, open doors of opportunity to speak out and that, Lord God, you would guide them in all of the decisions and actions that they make. And Father God, would you lead Australia to you, we pray, and overturn this wicked bill that clearly is not from you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. 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 Well, thank you so much, Martin, for joining us again today. It's lovely always to have you on here with us. I'd love to chat to you again in the future sometime. So thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. And maybe next time I'll be bringing some good news. <laughs> yeah, let's hope so, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Really okay. appreciate it. Well, this has been Compelling Reason. Until next time, may God bless you.